Welcome to the Jay and Pav Podcast Experience. Welcome to the Jay and Pav Podcast Experience. You're listening to The Che and Pav Show, Teachers Talking Teaching. Where two middle school teachers share our reflections, insights about the topics that matter the most in the classroom. So hey, Pav, join us in the hallway or even the parking lot, or better yet, how about the staff room? Welcome to episode 130 of the Chan Pav Show. Thank you for joining us as we sit around the table to talk teaching. Today we speak with elementary principal from Toronto, Ontario, Salima Kassam, about her journey with anti-racism work as an educator and the appropriate self-care that must come with it. It's a brilliant conversation, so I'm very excited to dive into it. But before we do... Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Pav Wander, half of the team that makes up the Che and Pav show. My counterpart sits right next to me, and I'll let him introduce himself. Let's get ready to rumble with tonight's main event. And when you use the thinking classroom model, mm-hmm. I think we discovered that uh, you are 82% of this dynamic duo of the Che and Pav show. Oh, I see. I was going to say, you've done the the let's get ready to rumble a few times now. We're almost 300 episodes in. I'm allowed to double up. <laughs> yes, you absolutely are. I hope the Canadian Podcast Awards heard that. 300 episodes in five years. Right. Uh, and so this is episode 130 of <laughs> the Chain Power Show. Have, just ignore it. Sure. <laughs> go on. No, I don't need to go on. No, this is great. Um, yes, we are. we are far in. To the Chain Path Show, although um, every time we sit down to start recording, I have to remind myself how to record because it's been two two months, two like that's a new record. Two months of this content because our ETT production uh, yes. teacher talk has sort of I wouldn't say consumed us, but there's episodes of the. Uh, that we've done for that, but you're right. Yes. It's almost like we're back, but we were back two months ago. Oh, we were back then too, because there has been a little <laughs> bit of disjointedness, and so I'm excited to be on the mic tonight. Yeah, and uh, and we also- do have some, like we have a couple of episodes in line now, so there won't be this long wait before the next episode of the Che and Pav show. That's for sure. The the return. I got a couple of things in this section called banter, so I can go wherever I want. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm glad that when I listen to the intro, it's back to teachers talking teaching, and I feel like I, I can own that title. Yeah. Because, you know, Pav, we've documented our journey of going centrally for a little bit, and I must say, there's no, te- there's no tire like teacher tire. Like, I'm exhausted. I wonder how I did it um, beforehand, but I also, I, it never, it, I never took to that central role in the in the context of did I see myself really having value or did I see that my position was was justifying the amount of investment given into me and and I'm thankful for that investment of the learning but I never felt I could get it anywhere I could never felt I could get it to the right places and and I walked away from that position just feeling like I I hadn't done enough with it and and feeling a little sort of empty in regards to my journey in education. I do not feel empty now. I am overwhelmed with things I need to do, want to do, and are consumed by. But going back to the title, I'm excited to talk about teaching because now I feel like I'm a teacher again. And not that central coaches don't do teaching. They do teaching, but it's not 
the same as being a teacher. There's just so many more no. responsibilities and things that weigh on you. I agree. Uh, I, I agree with that aspect. Um, coaching is not the same as teaching. Um, there are teaching elements involved. Um, I do th- I do also feel that we didn't have enough time in the position to really make it what we needed to make out of it. You mean the, the two weeks and then yeah. sent to being a <laughs> supply teacher wasn't yeah. enough? No, it wasn't enough. No. And, and it was even less for you. Like I had at least started in the, the I started the school year and then we were redeployed in May um, uh, as occasional teachers. But um, you started even later than that. So I think you had like six months in the role. And I, and I really felt like that it took about the first four, four months, easily four months to build enough relationship with the teachers that I was working with in order to actually make any sort of real effort, um, stand out in the role that I, that I was doing. And so, and even still, um, it was only effective. And I would say about 50% of the spaces that I was in. So there was, there was like, you have, there's resistance. There's, uh, people who are in their program and, you know, the things that we are trying with them are, are not really sticking. There's, um, changes that happen in the programming. There's changes that happen in the classroom and in the schools. Uh, there, there are so many factors involved that I really feel like, if we're monitoring growth and we're monitoring change, um, a year, like six months, forget about it. But even a year is really not a lot of time to monitor that kind of growth. And, and, and we didn't even get that one year. Like we didn't even get to have a start and a finish. There was interruption. Um, and so I feel like there was no closure to the role. There was no closure to that, um, particular central assignment that we were in. So, um, yeah, I definitely feel a lot more satisfaction being a classroom teacher, um, because I know that I can measure my impact immediately. I can see what's working. I can provide the feedback and students can provide me with the feedback of what is happening in the classroom immediately. Whereas in a coaching role, you're in the classroom once or twice a week. Um, and it takes so long to just build that relationship in a new school, in a new space with a new administration, with new students that you don't know at all. Um, it takes a lot longer to get to that point. So, um, yeah, definitely. It's something that I'm not ruling out for myself in the future. Um, and, and I think that it's something that I would like to get back to at some point in time, but, um, definitely really loving being back in the classroom right now. I like you talked about closure. That's a good way of putting it. There, there was no closure to mm-hmm. it. It reminds me of that old Donald Trump uh, series. You're fired. I seem to remember that being the last official transcript I had with. That yeah. was it. Yeah. I know that wasn't actually the term, but uh, that's what sits with me. That's what lands You're with fired. me. That's, yeah. that's right. Oh, really? Oh, okay. And I'll never talk to you again? Oh, okay. <laughs> and we'll never have any feedback again? And we'll never have any interaction again? Okay, good. We're gone. Yeah. That, that was the. So yes. yes, a little tongue in cheek on my part there, but yes, you can, you're right. You and I, as new central coaches, didn't really get a time to embed ourselves. And uh, the fact of no closure. Yeah. I'll agree with that. I also think now, now that I'm back in the teaching role, when you think about trying to make that impact as that classroom teacher that's busy, unless I'm seeing you every day, you become forgettable. Not, mm. not because you're forgettable. You just become forgettable. Like that routine of teaching is I, I need it daily. And if you're not daily, then it, then it doesn't become my hierarchy of needs and my hierarchy of wants and my hierarchy of things to do. It just becomes secondary because I can't build my program on something that might happen every five days. I just can't, I can't do it. It's too hard because we, we teaching is not something that you can plan for that, uh, that far in advance. I mean, you can have a general idea, but things change really quickly. They change on a dime. And so absolutely you need that immediate feedback and, and you need that consistency. And, and I don't think that teachers, I don't know. I was thinking that teacher, that students feel like you are forgettable when you don't, when they don't see you for a couple of uh, days or whatever. And and I would say that that is true. There, there's a lot of things that are happening in a school and students are not really worried about, Hey, where's that teacher that was here once or twice at the beginning of the year? What happened to them? Is, is that person coming back? Um, students are not thinking about that because there's so much stimulation in a school setting that, uh, you know, worrying about this random adult that was here (laughs) a few times. My class says that mid afternoon when they've gone for rotary, (laughs) who did we have this morning? Who spent all our time teaching language? Who was that guy? (laughs) Who was that guy? (laughs) 
<laughs> Pav, uh, let's remind ourselves, this is an interview episode. Now it we're is. so hungry to be on the mic, we're going on a little you know what? mini tangent. We'll have a fresh uh, Che and Pav, soul Che and Pav episode in two weeks for you all. But oh, today... I thought you were going to say 2027. <laughs> <laughs> we won't wait that long. Uh, but today we have a phenomenal episode with Salima Kassam. Um, she's somebody that she's a elementary school. She's a principal. Um, and um, we've met her probably at the start of our journey virtually, start of our podcasting journey virtually. But um, as we mentioned in the interview uh, that's coming up, um, we only really we met her in person two years ago. Teacher, or no, just a year ago. Teacher Leadership Collective. Yeah, we just met her a year ago in Although person. Although she is able to reference meeting you. Yes, I, I met her first. Um, and it was really funny because we literally bumped into each other, like walking. I was walking out of a room and she was walking into the room. And we literally bumped into each other and we looked at each other and immediately recognized one another. Uh, and it was just a really great moment. And we, we hugged each other. And even though we barely knew each other at that time, we had only interacted virtually. Um, but it was just one of those moments where, you know, you just really want to meet someone. And, and when you finally do, it's this it's this big moment. Um, and we had had this interview in the works for probably six months and just couldn't make it happen. And, and finally the stars aligned and we were able to sit down with Salima uh, a few days ago and, uh, and had this brilliant conversation that I'm so excited to dive into today. I'll simply add, you were so excited that I don't believe I speak in this interview to almost a 27 minute mark. <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to stick around to find out. And you're listening to the Chain Pav Show. You're listening to The Che and Pav Show. And of course, welcome to another great episode of The Che and Pav Show. And not that I wanted to spoil it right from the beginning, but it will be great. I know Pav likes to tell me you can't say this right away, because what if it's not? But I assure you, this one is and is going to be great. Uh, we have uh, Salima with us today to talk all things education. And I think this, uh, Pav, I know you and I could probably articulate that we're excited about this conversation, not because we're just performatively excited. We're excited because Salima, I think, is our first guest who we've actually met in person. And so this is how I know this conversation going to be exceptional. All our other guests, great guests, but we've never had a personal interaction. So, Salima, welcome to the show. Don't have me talk anymore. You can see Pat's already eye-rolling me. Please share a little bit about who you are, what you're seeing in the educational space, and where you see yourself in sort of the vastness of education, of what you want to do, what are your pillars, what are your foundations, and where do you think you can have that impact and how your journey has brought you there? And Looking forward to your first response. Great. I'm, I'm just, I didn't know I was your first guest that you'd, that you'd met in person. And I think we actually met last year at the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center. No, no, we, we, no, we met at One Civic. Oh, I met you. Yes, Salima, I, yes. I met you. And yeah, Pav and I met at One Civic and then yeah. Che and I met at the Japanese Canadian That's Cultural right. Center. That's right. We've That's all right. We if you've met Pav, him. you've met you've met us both. As I always say, uh, I am the consequence. I am always the consequence of being friends with Pav. So that's a joke. Yes, yeah. we met at Civic. But you, you know, I rem actually remember the excitement yeah. of it, and and uh, just that you're real. Yeah, I know. <laughs> real people. Yeah. I know. I think we bumped um, into, and we have a photo op. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we have a photo op. That yes, is we do. the proof. Yes, we do. Yes. Yes. Um, anyway, thank you both for having me. Uh, maybe I'll just start with a little bit of my journey in education and kind of situate myself. And um, I always like to say that I'm the product of Indigenous and Black feminist thought and action leaders in education. Um, and I'm also the product of many, many generations of very strong women in my family who have been formal and informal educators as well. Um, so I actually uh, did when I was when I was at the age where I was thinking about what I wanted to do when I grew up. Uh, 
my my father always said to me, I think you should be a teacher. And I remember my words were some to the effect of, uh, I don't think so. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be um, a backup dancer from Janet Jackson. I wanted to be a DJ. And then when I went to university, I ended up tutoring um, a lot of Afghan refugees. I was living in Montreal at the time. And, um, I, and I loved it. I loved it. I went on to do my post-baccalaureate diploma in learning disabilities, uh, in teaching students with learning disabilities. And I started teaching in Vancouver um, in what would have been considered, uh, they used to call it inner city. Um, we call it underserved communities. And then I ended up moving to Toronto and started teaching in the Jane Finch community at Gosford Elementary School. And I always say Jane Finch raised me to be the best educator that I could be. Uh, and interestingly enough, I actually started in secondary and fell into elementary and have never looked back. Um, I've done central work. So between the Toronto District School Board and the now defunct uh, Literacy and Numeracy Secretariat, which was attached to the Ministry of Education. I was seconded to teach in the Faculty of Education at York University for four years. I came back as a vice principal, uh, then became a principal and have just uh, left a role as centrally assigned principal for this is a very long title, Equity, Anti-Racism and Anti-Oppression and Teachers Learning and Leading. And I am in a school again as a school-based principal. Uh, and I'm also a mother of two fabulous kids. So uh, the teaching, the education is reciprocal because they teach me every single day how to be better. So that's, that's where I started. Um, and what do I see happening? Um, I think, you know, I've always positioned myself and I've been positioned by others as an anti-racist leader. Um, I am outspoken. I am an interrupter or a disruptor and I'm, and I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, I'm actually wearing my t-shirt that I think says strong female lead, which uh, my uh, a previous secretary had given to me. I don't know if that's a compliment or not. Uh, I'll take it as a compliment. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm hoping that we can talk about is in this work of interruption and in this work of trying to do transformative leadership, how we don't lose ourselves in the mix and how we don't lose our spirit in the mix. So I'm hoping that our, our conversation can, can start to go there. I think, um, Salima, we've, yeah, as we mentioned already, we've met a few times, we've met in different circumstances, we came across each other first, I believe online. Um, mm -hmm. And we started communicating in in that online world, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and we've seen the work that you have done. We've seen the incredible work that you have done firsthand. We've been in Thank professional you. development with you um, leading the, P the PDs for us. And, uh, and we've learned a lot from you and a lot from the work that you have done. And I think that what interested us in the last couple of months and um, myself, I think more so, uh, is, is that work of of taking care of ourselves or not losing ourselves in the work of transformative education, as you mentioned. Um, because I feel like this, and it's not that it's been a buzzword, I feel like it's finally being brought to light, like these feelings, these this heaviness, um, and how do we define it? What does it mean? Um, why are we feeling this way? And what can we do to to bring more light to it and and help us do continue to do that work while also being our best selves or being in a place where we can do this work optimally. Um, and so I think that I love this conversation. I love that you are bringing this to us as well. So um, can you share a little bit of, of this work with us and, and what it means to take care of ourselves, um, to rest, to be our best selves while doing this transformative educational work? Mm hmm you know, it has um, something that I had to consciously do 
was really sit down with myself and say, um, you know, do you feel good? Do you feel happy? Do you feel like um, you are doing the work in a way that centers human rights principles, that centers love, um, that centers collective care, that centers hope? And around January, February of this year, I, you know, I, I had really tough conversations with myself and it didn't feel good. I felt like I was going to work every single day, but I wasn't able to bring me, uh, Salima in her whole self. I felt like I was doing what others expected of me. Um, you know, Che used the word performative before. It felt performative. And I don't perform. I, I, or at least I don't perform consciously is what I should say. So I, if I'm going to do the work, I'm going to do it because it's anchored in theory and practice. I'm going to do it because it's it's rooted in what communities are saying. It's what multiple voices within communities are saying, not the loudest, not the ones that hold the most power. Um, and so I, I realized that I, this happiness that I'd always had uh, in whatever role I had in education wasn't there. And it was actually impacting home, it was impacting work. And so for me, I, I needed to remove myself and it took a lot of courage, you know? Um, it took a lot of me being able to say, if, if, if me being in this particular space as an anti-racist leader is, is not, is actually harming rather than furthering um, any kind of transformative practice, then, then I'm going to remove myself because if I am going to look after others, but I'm not looking after me, I'm not looking after my spirit and my soul and my heart and my mind, then I can't do the work effectively. Um, you know, I, I started off by saying that I'm, I'm rooted in a lot of indigenous and black feminist thought and, and bell hooks actually is, is, is always one of my go-tos. Um, and she talks about labor for freedom and she talks about being able to collectively imagine what's possible. And when it feels stifling, when it feels like, um, literally like you can't breathe, um, then for me, I had to go into myself to be able to nurture my imagination and be able to nurture hope. Um, Maria Makaba, who's an incredible abolitionist from the United States, um, talks about hope being a discipline. So I needed to take time to nurture that hope and feel hopeful again. And so I, um, I went on a leave for the first time in my life. I, I went on a mental health leave and I needed to remove myself from, you know, the, the formal piece of education because education doesn't just happen in schools and it doesn't just happen in institutions. It happens within community and it happens within family. And that's what I did. I went back to family and I went back to community, um, to that notion of collective care and reciprocal care and, and I practiced being free, that practice of freedom that Bell Hooks talks about. Um, now I know it was a privilege for me to be able to do that. Not everybody is able to do that, so I do recognize that. Um, but um, that's, that's what I needed to do. Uh, and, I, and I really had to think about how uh, my physical body, my, my mind, my emotions, my spirits um, were all interconnected. Even what I was eating or not eating, um, 
actually getting up and walking around and not being as we're on a computer right now, but not being stuck on a computer for an entire day or, or, or being stuck on the phone because everybody needs you in that moment at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, I set boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so now it's how do I maintain those boundaries now that I'm back in a formal role in education and keeping all of that nurturing spirit and learning with me as, as I continue to move forward, because, you know, as we're sitting here on October 22nd, 2023, the, the world is violent around us. There's a crisis happening around us. Um, so if we're going to look at transformative change and practice, we also have to start with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? And, and make sure that we're being true to our principles and, and not getting swayed into this screaming angry void because it can be very easy to go there and then lose ourselves in the process. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. I don't know if I went off in five tangents there. No, you did. And you've provided me with um, a little additional food for thought. And, and it's something that I think I've been grappling with for some time. And I don't know, Che, if you've also felt the same way. Um, when we interrogate ourselves, I think it's very good for us and how we disrupt ourselves within the system. Do you feel like when we disrupt ourselves and interrogate ourselves and um, and take care of ourselves to do our best work that we're able to then go and disrupt the system? Because what I'm what I'm hearing, and maybe I'm wrong, um, you removed yourself from the system to be able to do your best work, but we want to be able to progress the system eventually. Um, mm -hmm. Can, can the progress we make within ourselves also help us to move the system along as well? And maybe this is a question that we can't answer in this conversation, um, but I'd love to hear your insight or if you've, even, or if you've thought about it in, in any kind of way as well. And, and it's something, I know it's a little bit more personal for myself, like I do a lot of work on myself, but how, how am I using that to make progress collectively? I don't know if that mm -hmm. even makes any sense. It, you know what it does because I, you know, I think I've been, or there's a tendency to, to just move through life in anger. And especially in education, you know, we've seen for too long, decades. I mean, you know, the, the work of anti-racist leadership is not new. Um, so there's there's a collective anger and that anger is needed right it, it propels movements it fosters movements it mobilizes people but i think what comes out of that anger then is this movement to action and how we hold compassion for each other and we're able to engage in a conversation uh, how we move from uh, a friend of mine calls it the ego, egos and icons mentality. There's one way to do this work, and this is the only way to do this work. And if you don't do it this way, then you're doing it wrong. And we're shutting people down and we're canceling people. And that's not to take away from violations of human rights, but also how do we hold each other in a space of grace? And that was something that I needed to work on. I needed to hold grace for myself to be able to hold grace for others. So then as we, as I come back into a formal system, my immediate instinct is not to, um, you know, break a relationship in a, whether it's a conversation with a, with a colleague or it's a conversation with somebody else in education, but, but to hold compassion and hold grace and have patience. You know, the system has underserved, so many communities um, in interconnected ways as well for so long. And, and, and the pace always feels too slow because, you know, students and similar communities of students are continually shut out of school. They're, they're silenced, uh, you know, stories that start with genocide as opposed to beauty and brilliance. But we have to hold compassion for each other as adults. So that's what I'm trying to hold hold into. So back to Mariana Macaba's famous quote, hope is a discipline, right? That that hope, and that hope is situated in, 
and collective care. And I always say, if, if people haven't read Bell Hook's book, All About Love, we have to have love for ourselves in order to do this work. And when I think about, uh, you know, the seven grandfather teachings or, or grandmother teachings or in whatever way it's being presented and positioned, you know, love is spoken about there. And when we talk about culture relevant and responsive pedagogy, Gloria Latson Billings talks about love, right? And love is also justice. So it's, it's all of these things intertwined. It's an action. And it's, and it's remembering that none of us are experts. We have expertise in different ways, but we're not experts. And I think that's been part of the problem as well, is we, we've, we sort of hold these people as, as the holders of all knowledge. And I know that, that I've fallen into that trap as well. But we have to learn together to bring ourselves up together, to, to make ourselves better together. Yeah. Um, Che, I'm going to let you speak, <laughs> but uh, I, I love the way that you said that, um, that hope is a discipline. We have to, we have to provide that space for one another. I, I almost feel like, um, like we have to be in it and then we have to take a step back and do a little bit of self work and then come mm -hmm. back in it and then come back mm -hmm. to it and then bring our, our learning of ourselves and that learning of love, I think that is the root of everything. Um, and then come back to the work as well. So I appreciate that answer and that follow up um, as well. And Che, I know you, I know you're itching to add something here and, uh, and continue the conversation. Um, I didn't mean to ice you out, but I was really, really into this uh, response from Salima. So thank you. I'm, I'm so glad you said that with a straight face because you absolutely meant to just ice me out early on. I think you actually removed me from the chat about three minutes in and then I just, you know, <laughs> coded my way back into this conversation. But the conversation has been great and, and maybe I'm just consuming and observing the first, you know, 20 minutes, but it's been a fantastic conversation. There's so many things that I'm thinking. Uh, I love that idea of discipline with hope. And I made the connection not to center my story, but I thought of my journey into central, central coaching for a little bit, where I think I went in with a naive hope or what I thought that space would become. And I, I felt, and that's not to say that the space was that, the space wasn't what I had sort of envisioned when I went in and I sort of lost some of that hope. And so I became a little disgruntled with where I was and the impacts I was making. And so... Um, when we had this conversation of, of rejuvenating ourselves, I feel rejuvenated going back into the classroom. Not that everyone has to have that journey, but I got lost in, in that space and I, and I lost hope because I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, not in the technical sense, I knew what I was doing, but I lost that spiritual sense of what is it that I'm doing here? I can't measure my impact. I'm getting engaged in lots of, we talked about that performative conversations and I not to say other people were performative I guess I got caught in, in performative conversation not for me to gaslight anyone you know and that disrupt yourself mentality I'm just thinking of what I get out of that space and so it was back to the classroom has been my rejuvenation and it makes me think about what are the things that people are doing to rejuvenate because as you both were having that great conversation I think we get really simple things of what people need to do to I guess the system puts, oh, you know, just take time for yourself on the weekend. And it's almost the system putting it back on you to rejuvenate yourself. Because I don't remember whose tweet it was, but there was a tweet about if you need your weekends to freshen up, then maybe your job is too taxing on you and your system's getting a pass on finding ways to alleviate um, the tensions on staff. I mean, I could give one anecdotal observation when you think about system how we use our system. Do we use our system to stretch teachers out to the max or do we use our system to try to alleviate stuff from their plate? And as a teacher, um, you know what? I love teaching, but I know it's exhausting. And sometimes I look at schedules and I look at uh, the way the system's built up. And I said, this schedule's used to to stretch me out as far as humanly possible. And the sense that we're in ingraining a space for me to stay fresh or to reflect on, on my practice just isn't in the space, just isn't in the system. At least that's my perception. It's not to say it's not there, just that's how it lands on me. And so as you're having that great conversation, I was thinking a few things. When you think about rest is resilience, what does rest look like? Uh, what uh, onus should we have on our system to provide spaces of rest? Because as much as we, we have the pedagogy and we, and, we ha and we know it works and we know it has a place, does our system really value it? And if our system doesn't, often our system will say what we value, but then it doesn't 
take the time, put the resources in to to do it. I mean, I could even think about high school applications mm -hmm. and you say we, we're changing all these simple rules to make high schools more accessible for everyone, but I'll just take an art specialty school. There isn't one in Rexdale. So making it a free choice to just go there, those aren't the obstacles. I can tell you as a grade eight teacher, the obstacles isn't that students couldn't make the application there. It's that it's an hour and a half commute and seven, seven different TTC rides. But the simple solution is just to say, oh, everyone can go if you feel like going. Yes, there's a place for that. But the real solution is actually building an art school in Rexdale so students can get there in 10 minutes. But that takes a lot of money and that's a lot of system change. So that's not coming. Um, and so thanks for giving me my, my three minutes. So Lima, the question actually is, <laughs> is when you think, when you think about rest is resilience, one, what are you doing for that rest? What are you doing for it? Because it can look many different ways. And then mm -hmm. what illness or what um, responsibilities do our systems have to honor it and create space for it beyond just on your weekends? Mm -hmm. I now I'm thinking about an art school being built in Rexdale and I'm like, how do we how do we make that happen? It's needed. Um, it's needed. It's needed. Um, so I'm actually going to take your words, Che, and I'm going to I'm actually going to position it as rest is resistance. Yeah. So Trisha Hersey talks about rest is resistance. And so being able to say um, my body is a site of free labor is not something that you're going to get to use um, anymore. So I can continue to do this work, but I can't do it alone. So how are you supporting me and how are you doing it with me? So how are we getting down and dirty in in a clean sense when we are are, are doing this work of, of education? Uh, so I'm going to give a really, it feels um, like a small example, but I I'm, I'm thinking about the hope that can come from this. So tomorrow, the school that I'm a principal at, we are all K to five going to a farm and we are going to pick apples and look at pumpkins and play with chickens. And that's gonna be our curriculum for the day. And so when we talk about what does it mean for self-care, it's an opportunity for adults and students to be outside, breathe some fresh air, touch things that are growing from the soil and and our our curriculum is going to grow for the, from that and what could it turn into where what could it turn into it could talk, talk ugh, it could turn into a conversation on food insecurity mm -hmm. it could talk about um you know afro indigenous ways of growing uh you know foods and and reclaiming the land you know, we could talk about, you know, who has access to natural resources, fresh, clean resources, and who doesn't. That's anti-racist pedagogy right there. And there was curriculum to back that all up, but we're, we're going out of the classroom because we can get really mired in the, the, the walls of a building. So that's one small way that you know, 200 of us are kind of breaking open that traditional way of teaching and learning and and creating spaces for each other that feel hopeful. Now, yes, that takes budget. So, you know, we've had to think about allocation of resources and it's taken time to organize, but the tools are there. So I'm going to say the tools are there, but it's how we have to create and think differently, that imagination and the possibilities. And that's what I mean about um, being able to take that time to do things differently. And we keep hearing this, right? You know, the pandemic has taught us that we cannot do education the same way but we're actually still doing education the same way in a lot of ways, right? Our frameworks haven't necessarily changed that much. The demands on educators, in fact, have increased. The demands on families have increased. So we have to imagine new possibilities, um, a new futurity, I think, for education. So, you know, that, that art school in Rexdale actually becomes something. And whether it's we're forging new community partnerships, 
with local artists that work in the community of Rexdale and working with families to have that happen in school or to take students out of the building and take them to community because education is reciprocal. Maybe that's what it is too, but I think we have to collectively imagine different possibilities. There's um, a conference coming up, uh, 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 I would say a mentor and friend of mine, uh, Tanitia Monroe, who works with the research department at Toronto District School Board and the Center of Excellence for Black Student Achievement is has organized a conference at York University that's coming up. So I'm doing a little bit of a plug right now, but it's hearing from voices of black identifying youth who are saying this is, let's think differently about what we can do together. You know, we talk about student voice. I know the two of you are, are you know, leaders in engaging student voice. And so it's another opportunity to hear from young people about what's needed. And for us, the adults to, to actually listen and then make a change, right? And I think that's what you're talking about, Che, is where's that change? Because there's a lot of talk. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of talk from people, but that action and that action is, is us working on ourselves and then being able to bring that back into our different collective spaces yeah. with a renewed hope. Yes. I think action... Go ahead, oh, Pat. sorry, Pat. <laughs> I was going to say that that action piece, I think, is of what Pav and I have learned a lot in our journey is the performance, whether willingly or unwilling, to think that they, the, the work they're doing is actually action or if it's just theory. And I think mm. one thing uh, that we have found is, is that action for a lot of folks, and not that this isn't part of the action scenario, just is the conversation. But as sort of as classroom teachers, conversation is a piece, but it's not the only piece. And often when you talk about conversations, it's oh, the conversation in the, in the classroom, for example. But I would always say, you've got four people engaged in that conversation. Most people become consumers. Most people disengage. And we allow the same four or five voices all the time to manifest. And as a teacher, I, very early on, I actually had a, a coach come in. And one thing we chose to is I asked him to do a tally chart of who I was interacting with to engage conversation. And it was eye opening. I did pretty well, but I also saw that I was, you know, tapping into 10 different students more often than other ones. And it shifted. And then when I go back to my central and those spaces, I said in the teacher space, in the leadership space, I then see the same thing is that I see a lot of, we're going to do action. And it's going to start with a conversation. And I'm like, and, and because the mm -hmm. conversation is very limiting. And then I often find that so many of the examples of actions and we have a conversation and my always thought is and what and what else because the conversation is, is really beneficial for three and it's probably alienating for 10 and so conversation is one piece of my my multiple choice board or part of my continuum to action so I love the fixation on action because where do I sort of position myself I I don't position myself or gift myself the category of a disruptor I sort of think as a white male I'm it's I, I don't get to call myself a disruptor. So I, when I think of a disruptor, I always think I don't have the receipts to dare make that, that claim. Um, when I think of where am I doing the work, where do I think I have benefit? I think I provide uh, real world examples for what a classroom teacher can do to in instill in their classroom. Not because I'm doing it great, but because I'm using multiple different spaces to amplify voice. And then when you talk about positionality at the beginning, yes, I'm a white male, but I'm a white male teaching in a racialized community for 22 years. And so I've had my failures, I've had my successes. I can see where voices have been amplified and, and I've sort of gone around the journey. And I always think that that example is a, is a worthy example in the space of anti-racism what does the white male teacher do in a racialized community because that dynamic is always different and so mm -hmm. i always think for me it's about decentering myself as much as i can because i am the the strong voice no matter what whether speaking or not um so that's my my randomness as you talk because it's all about action and then it's it, those action steps because you provided real action steps or thoughts that can initiate how we could bring the arts and amplify the arts in the Rexdale community rather than saying you need to leave Rexdale in order to be an artist and one could argue that in our high school model of going away to all these different schools we're trying to elevate community not say you need to leave community mm -hmm. so I've always been a big proponent of the our local feeder schools those are the schools you should be going to because this is your community and you want to elevate your community so thanks for those action steps Pat, you're going to have to remind me on Monday morning to start putting those into place. <laughs> Thanks, Che. No, you always provide a lot of value. And I know you and I have definitely had that conversation about action and what that looks like. Um, and and it's, it, I think it's hard to 
for a lot of teachers describe what that actually looks like because perhaps for a lot of teachers they haven't put the two and two together that the the mm -hmm. the things that they are trying in their spaces are action pieces to, in order to get that representation for the students or bringing in different kinds of books and it, and it does go beyond just talking about the issues it's uh, what am i doing for the students in order to hear every voice and make sure that every student is being seen so i think that that is a valuable um, piece and and i'm thinking so Lima, there's probably a lot there that maybe you want to respond to, and I'll give you an opportunity to do that as well. Um, in your introduction, you also, you talked about informal education and the, in, the impact of informal education on you growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and when you, when, you, when you speak about this excursion that the school is going on, um, that was the connection that I made. These are the pieces of informal I mean it's in a formal setting you're doing it with your formal institution um, but you're learning in a way that is not the formal way that we would learn every single day and and I'm thinking that 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 is these are the experiences that students are going to remember the conversations that happen in these spaces whether you are talking about um, uh, connections to the land or whether you are talking about food insecurity, those con conversations are going to stick and ha probably have a higher tendency of leading to some sort of action afterwards than reading about it from a book or even watching a YouTube video about it. That, that firsthand experience is really what is going to lead to to that impactful learning, which is what we want to be seeing in, in the classroom space. Um, and I do want to talk about the next question that we have as well, but I know that we've just discussed a, a lot of things here and I want to give you an opportunity to maybe reflect on any of it or respond to anything or to add anything before we go on to kind of change the, change the topic a little bit. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I think, this, this idea of action on the ground is what brought me back to a school. Because I think, um, you know, we, we do get very caught up in theory and practice, or theory, and then trying to implement it into practice. But for me, my personal experience is to really be able to, to co-facilitate that where it matters most, which is with students, with families, with communities. And so, you know, as, as I reflect on what we're talking about, I, I know that's what drives me. I, 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 I can't um, do the work from afar. And I, and I felt like some of my other roles, I was, I was too removed from what was actually happening you know, in, in actual time. So it's, I, I guess even my, my trajectory, I've sort of, I've been in schools and then I've come out and then I've come back into schools and I've come out and, and I think that's really served me well in my journey because I'm, I'm dipping in and out. And I think it, it also, again, speaks to that imaginative, creative possibility that we we can all have as educators because we it, there's there's no fixed line right like there's no fixed line in teaching it's not x plus y equals z it would be so nice if it was but you know for any educator we can tell you that any day is going to be different any hour is going to be different any student is going to be different and and we hopefully are different right so you know, it, it's, it's getting messy. And so it's finding that joy in getting messy because there, there isn't a roadmap. And, you know, we're, we're really co-creating these roadmaps with each other, for each other. And, you know, as I've, you know, learned from both of you, I think that's what the two of you have, have done so well in so many different ways with students, with colleagues, um, you know, in your writing, it's, you know, finding different ways to reach different audiences and to, and to be able to talk about practice as action. So that's, that's where my brain has, has gone right now. 
Thank you, Salima. And that's, um, that's very kind of you. I, I think that Che and I, we, we spend a lot of time reflecting and that reflection is really what in many cases, and we've heard so many different educators um, that we've spoken to on the podcast and in other areas as well, is is that actual act of sitting back. And I think that that's part of that's part of that self care process is is having an opportunity to sit back and say, okay, here's where I am, here's what we need to do, um, and so how do we get there? Uh, and uh, and I think that's key. But that leads me to thinking about why do I feel so guilty when I do that? Like, why do I, and I don't know if you felt this way at all. I'm sure there was a little bit of that because I can't imagine um, taking a step back from work from myself to take care of myself. Um, so please speak to that. I know because there's, it's very multifaceted um, where this, this feeling of guilt comes from and why it's so profound in education. Um, so if you want to either speak from your own personal experience or even your professional learning in this area, um, please tell us a little bit about what that feels like. Absolutely. Guilt. Oh, my goodness. I love my family, but I was raised with guilt. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we are products of a capitalist society. So it's, you know, what's the next thing you're going to do? What's the next thing you're going to achieve? What's next, 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 next. And um, I think uh, society as a whole has moved into this checks and balances of, you know, you have X number of degrees or you have X number of qualifications. And we're really, you know, people can get very caught up in this academic accolade sort of competition actually and when we're not producing or we're not doing it feels like we're not meeting our responsibilities and i think those are those can be from, you know imposed by family imposed by society imposed by employers um so i did i felt guilt i felt guilt about not going to work every single day. But I had to really uh, reframe my thought process. And I worked with, um, with other teachers. So teachers um, who were therapists, teachers who were holistic nutritionists, um, teachers who were yoga therapists. Um, my kids were my teachers, my family were my teachers to say, um, I need to give my per myself permission to breathe. I need to give myself permission to come back to who I am. And I think in education, to be able to do that and to say no is hard, but it's important. So, you know, for, you know, we work uh, as public school educators and publicly funded institutions. So yes, there are parameters, there are roles and responsibilities, the Education Act, the Ontario College of Teachers, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we're bound by those professional responsibilities and obligations. But I think there's also an assumption that our time, our, our personal resources can be given because it's about the students. And I think that becomes the narrative. Well, it's for the students. And yes, there are so many of us that would want to do whatever we can, but we cannot do it alone. And so when we come back to thinking about how do we make education better, it can't be on an individual. It's a collective responsibility. So this guilt that we hold, I think, really fits into this individualistic notion of capitalism and production like we're not you know cogs in a factory um so i don't know if that answers the question but those are those are things that i've been thinking about again coming back to that collective care mm -hmm. that reciprocal care and i don't know that we've had that for each other we're not holding each other with compassion now in 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 my family it was you know weekends were not for rest it was 
cleaning and and you know groceries and and cooking and and I'm, and I'm still doing that but i also will say i'm going to lie down for an hour and i'm and i'm going to be okay with it or i'm going to binge watch something on netflix that's really mindless because i need that right now and i think the more we practice it the better we'll get at it like anything else, I guess. That's right. Otherwise, we find ourselves dissociating in our cars after. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes, that's just sitting there because you're not able to interact with another human because you've just given everything of yourself to other people. That's right. <laughs> Salima, when you sh when you shared your story, I'm reminded of a, a principle. Oh, sorry. I'll take that back. Edit that out, Path. Not a principal. <laughs> Another adult uh, early on in my teaching career that would always preface everything. Remember, we're for the children. And I went on a little mini rant. And I said, if we are setting the bar so low as to think I, as a teacher, need to be reminded that I'm here for kids, we are going nowhere of importance. Because I said, I figured that out when I was doing all my volunteer coaching, when I was working in my community centers, long before I got into teaching. So if you need to convince me that I'm here for the children, we are are going nowhere because the I, I'm up here. I got room to go up, but if you're starting with that, we're here for the kids. We're going nowhere because you've lost me because I instantaneously know you know nothing about me or my craft. And I guess maybe I don't know enough about you. So when you said that, I had that flashback to way back when. But I also had a flashback to another great um, interaction with a principal. Choose to edit or not, Path, um, where they told me I was there early, early in my teaching career. Friday night, five thirty, marking, and he came up and he said. You 100% happy and rested and 80% prepared is far better than the reverse. Go home. And I'm not leaving my room until you get it. Uh, he waited a few 10, 15 minutes. I said, okay, okay, <laughs> but let me finish this. But I, re I remember that. And also, as you were talking, I was thinking about this hustle culture. And yes. then I also, Pat, you and I have had this conversation off the camera because I haven't quite ready, really articulated it, that I find, especially in the social media space as well, there's a there's a little bit of a manipulation, a psychological manipulation on people to do more. And I often wonder who's sending these messages. Um, and, and I, you know, I ha can't totally articulate it at the moment, but I know I've been really... Th paying a lot of attention to a lot of psychological warfare and a lot of manipulation in the edu space about people delivering certain messages and really being really grayish in where they are. They're not as open to their positionality because their stances put other people at risk, put other people to have to make a stand while they don't need to. And so this is, this is all a big cloud right now, but I, it was, I was reminded on that when we talk about working hard and, and this pressure to work on people, it's overtly stated, but I think the underlying there is a culture of people, folks, I don't know if that's, the right term path you definitely need to edit that underlying with a little bit of manipulation where people feel like oh they're, they're it's not directly pushing them but there is just an underhand this manipulation of people insinuating that they're doing this type of work when either they aren't but they're making you sort of give up to give more and so that is pav will tell you a useless statement because i named no names and i said something specific but it's just a feeling i have by what i'm seeing in the old overall social media edu space where you can learn so much, but it can also enrage you so much. Mm -hmm. But Slima, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. You can dive in and, and comment on anything I said. What you're finding out here is this is exactly how I teach. It's random thoughts. And then I hope some student extracts something of wisdom that's able to turn it into something of brilliance. But this conversation I know has been fantastic. You can comment on some sort of final thoughts, but our sort of rollout question is where can folks find you and what's next for you in this educational space? Because yes, you've laid this foundation of where you've been and you have been all kinds of different spaces. I would love to have had so many different spaces to get a real perspective because I just think my six months of coaching opened my eyes. I can't even imagine the amount of experience you've had to really know what you see from every perspective. Um, so we want to gift, thank you for gifting us your insights, your, your, Ex I know you don't want to say expertise, but your experiences then. Um, and one, like I said, let our audience know where they can find you and what's next for you. Oh, what's next? I love that question. Um, Cause I always, I always think of it of what's next is I, um, I need to make lunch. Mm -hmm. um, and what's next is I need to do the laundry. Um, but what's next is, is also some writing. Um, but before before I get to that, I you know I, I also want to um, sort of recognize that that many of us haven't been given a, an option to take a break from work, right? So the 
the um, the free labor um, of of black indigenous racialized females in particular, but not necessarily female identifying folks, um, has been taken for granted for a really, really, really long time. And so I think there's unlearning that many of us um, need to do because it's we people have just been positioned as no opportunity to make a mistake, no opportunity to slow down because, um, you know, we will receive backlash for that. So there's some definite unlearning um, as a whole that, that, that we need to do for that. And so as I continue my, my own journey and in, in unpacking that for myself and and working in community to to support and and be an ally with and for um, friends and colleagues. I just I think about boundaries and the collective responsibility that education um, needs people to have rather than than individuals. So we get away from those egos and icons kind of mentality. Um, I I. I did some writing and I, I have a chapter coming out in a book, um, October, 2024. Uh, so um, I don't know if I can say the title and everything of the book yet. So, um, but I, but I will say it's, it's based on some of my work that I did in my master's thesis. And part of the title is about negotiating fragments and it's, um, really about how do I, how do I lead if I can't lead with all the parts of myself whole. Um, so I was really excited about that coming out. Um, and then I've been thinking about and, and dreaming about um, some writing with my cousin, um, sort of looking into untold stories of our family and our ancestors. And I'd, I'd love to make a connection to, um, you know, recipes and foods that have been um, silenced or forgotten or taken away because uh, I, I want to pay homage to the really, really strong women in my family that, that I'm a product of. So that's where my, my brain is on the personal side. And then really just finding a, a moment to laugh every single day at work with with people that I love working with um, and and creating spaces of joy and belonging that we that we talk about but actually making those happen so that's what's next for now in addition to making lunch and doing laundry <laughs> doing the laundry. those are two things <laughs> on my list laundry. too <laughs> exactly <laughs> Exactly. Oh, and making a new music playlist as well, because that's that's important. Also, yes. Yeah, I, I yeah. left my AirPods in my classroom, and as Che knows, I've been complaining about that all weekend. So I have to. <laughs> it's a life without music this weekend, and it's hard for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, no. Just, just look been... over your shoulder, look over your shoulder, and you got your record player. I know, I know it only, right the there. side only plays for 18 oh, minutes, look but. At that. And all the records sl- that are piled up right there. Amazing. Uh, no, Amazing. I know, but then the kids complain about the music choice, and mom, why is it blasting through the house? <laughs> so, um, so definitely, we, we definitely appreciate, um, want to give you the time to get back to your weekend, and we appreciate you spending some time with us uh, on the weekend as well. Um, we're very excited to hear about your writing projects and very excited to hear more about it. And that book, I know an, a year sounds like a long time away, it uh, but it'll come fast. Believe me, there are so many, as Che and I have learned so many little pieces that have to come together before that project can be released, <laughs> but very excited. Um, and, and if that book that you're writing with your cousin does come to fruition, um, and we hope it does, I'd love to, love to read that as well because that's very near and dear to my heart as well um salima thank you so much for gifting us your time this weekend and your knowledge um and everything that you have learned along the way on your educational personal professional journey um we appreciate all of the time that you've given us and we appreciate learning and growing with you um since we have become connected so hopefully that is something that can continue as well so thanks again for joining us on the Che and Pav show 
Absolutely. Thank you. This has been a gift for me today. So thank you. And you're listening to The Chain Pav Show. That was a brilliant interview. Absolutely was. Um, it leaves me with chills, actually, because there were so many points in there that were just so relevant and poignant, and um, they just hit home for me that um, it, was, it was great. I just left feeling really good from that interview. I think in the, in the social justice space, Salima talks with with a, a compassion and love that resonates before everything else. And wherever you are on the journey, you feel like you want to align yourself with her positionality. You want to see this work through her perspective, that there's that loving and caring component that is crucial. Pav, you know, you and I have had this conversation about whether you want to call it in or want to call it out. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, what is your next step? And if that is what you perceive to be the work as the recipient of the call and call it, I'll tell you that more often than not that alienates the person. And I think, I think what tends to happen is we oversell the story of the person that's called in or called out that makes these sweeping changes. I think when we strive to make people uncomfortable and we chase making people uncomfortable, there's a, there's an erroneous thought that somehow that leads to growth because as a teacher, I'm never striving to make someone feel uncomfortable. I'm trying to inspire. I'm trying to build that relationship and we're hoping that we can grow together collectively with that empathy and love. And I, I think Salima resonates with that message yeah. she that, she called it leading with grace mm. she spoke about that a few times she talked about how um it took her a while to get to that stage where she felt like i need to lead with grace i need to give people grace i and i expect that same grace to be given to me when i need that grace i need that break i need to be you know i need i need this i need to not feel uncomfortable and so um, I, that really stood out to me when she was talking about leading with grace. And the other thing that, that really stood out through this conversation was, um, was our talk about um, theory to practice and what the action work actually looks like mm. when, when you're doing um, disruptive work in the school setting, when we're doing decolonization work, when we are um, actually taking a look at what our education system is and what our students actually need um, and, and what education should be and what does that actually look like in the classroom space. And, and I really loved what she shared um, about her own self and her own practice, but also professionally, um, how she leads with that kind of love um, in the classroom or in, in sorry, in her school. Um, so, so I thought that that was a really poignant piece that, um, that we had as part of the conversation. I agree. Yeah. I just, well, there were so many good nuggets. And I I'm know. Just thinking about that, and I'm just going to rehash conversations we had in the interview. This idea, because you know, you and I, regardless in our, content that we record and make tweets about and social media, a lot of our conversations behind is this idea of theory to practice and how many people share what they believe to be practice, but it's just theory. And as right. a classroom teacher, I'm able, I'm able to articulate that. Right. Or I can see it as that this, this isn't the practice. This is the theory. This is the theory. You're uh, just reiterating the, the theory. theory. And then thinking you're, you're advocating for the practice. That, that right. ain't it. Because I'll tell you as a teacher, that ain't And we yeah. have that example of conversation. Yeah. And it, a conversation I feel is moving towards the practice but if we just stop it we're just gonna have conversations i think we articulate this in the interview this i i would argue that's not the work based on my 22 years experience as a white male teaching a racialized community that's that's a a small part of it but that's i still feel dabbled on the theory especially Mm -hmm. when people articulate we're gonna have conversations and yeah and please and right a hundred percent because I mean, it's, it's not creating any change. The conversation is talking about it and you can talk about potential change that will come from the conversations, but it's not actually yet doing. It's definitely an important step in the process. hundred percent. I will agree with that. Um, but it's the doing, it's the change in practice that is the action. And, and I think that that's the piece that's really, really difficult, um, to articulate when, when we're having these 
conversations. Sometimes, Pav, I think not enough PD is teacher driven. And when you talk yeah. about that concept of the teacher down the hall, there are teachers around us that are doing great tasks, great activities. I think of our work uh, in reframing Remembrance Day and digital photography. That's a task that does the work. This is one way of doing it. Yeah. We have our, our unit on writing stories through music and lyrics. So it's, it, it's, that's part of the work. You see right. students that dive right in that gift you so much of their identity and their story through the songs and the lyrics they want to talk about. That That's an activity. And mm-hmm. it might not be the greatest activity, but it be, could go into a bank of activities you can use to do the work rather than solely just advocating for, it's a conversation. No, I, I want to know. And I think a lot of our PD gets caught in people that are well researched but don't necessarily have the practical experience and I think what happens a lot in our PDs is that we just don't weave the two together when I think about how many times I've been asked anything on any topic I just told you how many times want to hear it again <laughs> that's how many times yeah. and that, not that I'm on any mountaintop but I say I'll represent the teacher voice the teacher voice just isn't seen often enough and I often think that it seems like people feel they need to teach teachers all the time believe yeah. it or not there's a whole bunch of teachers that know exactly what they're doing and if we would just listen to them and create space for them to share wonderful resources and wonderful lessons perhaps we could collectively come up with more action steps you know what I also think and, and, I, th- and I think we started to allude to this in the conversation with Salima is I think that there is also a disconnect between from going from the action piece to the theory. I think that there's there are a lot of teachers that are doing really great things in the classroom but have a difficult time connecting it to the theory that supports uh, anti-racist work, uh, mm. anti-oppression work. Um, and, and I think that that shouldn't be discredited. I think that we should actively go looking for that incredible work rather than just going into classrooms and looking for deficits. I think it's really important to go in and look for those incredible things that teachers are already doing that support the theory that we speak of. And hope that we see it. Because I think, Pav, as you're telling that story, I sort of had an aha moment. You're so right. And I was thinking about our podcasting journey. At first, it was a tech tool. It was a podcast. And then we sort of were able to make those bridge to the anti-racist work, the identity work, telling Mm -hmm. stories or honoring oral communication, oral storytelling. And then I remember being told, yeah, your podcast is really cool, eh? (laughs) Believe it or not, it's a little bit more than cool. But this is also because part of our problem is that the 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 theory can't make it's, it's both ways the theory can't connect to the action the action can't connect to the theory and the people that are in a position to make those connections don't necessarily see it themselves yeah they don't see it themselves which is really like it's it's harmful it's harmful to many spaces and i think that when those connections aren't made or those connections are discredited um, by people that are in positions of power then it really it alienates the teacher from wanting to continue to learn about the theory. Um, and I'm not saying that for everyone, that is not a blanket statement. I'm just saying that this, this is something that I have seen happen. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to bridge that gap. And I think it all comes back to leading with that grace and, and you need to just have that ability to, to provide like effective feedback for teachers and be kind and be graceful with how you present the information and the work um, to your staff, to your peers, to your colleagues, to your students. I mean, this is, it's, it's such important work that we need to find it wherever we can. We have to find the brilliance. We have to find that excellence wherever we can. Pav, when I, when we record interviews, my gauge for what makes them or how do I know they're good interviews isn't the downloads. It isn't the listens. It is always, are we still engaged by the topic a mm-hmm. week later when we do these reviews? Are we still fired up? Yeah. Right now we're fired up. We could do another 30 minutes on this. And all of a sudden, I already knew the interview was great, Celine, but don't think I didn't think it was great back then. But I definitively know now it was a great interview because yeah. I'm still fired up by the content. And thinking about it. Think- we were talking about it, not not just that day, but the next day and the day after that. And, and today, like a week later. So it, um, it reminds me what I hope this podcast is. Yeah. And Pav, when you talk about we're not making blanket statements, all we are is just two teachers sharing our insights, sharing what's going on. Doesn't necessarily make it right. You know what we want to be? We want to be right, but we don't have to be right. And 
the value of this platform and this space isn't in what we said, is in the conversation and dialogue that it ignites and sparks That's for right. our continued growth later. And I yeah. think what Salima did indicates our conversation means it worked. We're still talking about it. But this isn't the end of the conversation. We're mm -hmm. no blankets over here. It's open <laughs> up for more conversation. Yes. Maybe we said something that you don't agree with. Maybe we said something that you do agree with. Let's have those open dialogues. Now, don't let me get caught on the conversation rant and turn these conversations into actionable pieces. So if you thought maybe I hadn't said something right, you say, hey, I've tried this lesson. I've tried this. I've tried that. That didn't work. Let's keep building. Let's keep growing because that's what the Chain and Pav show is supposed to be about. And that comes back to what I said at the beginning. This is why I feel much more comfortable with the mic being a teacher than I was behind the mic being a central coach. Mm -hmm. Not again, and that's uh, my take and my experience with central coach, not the blanket statement, although Pat's throwing blankets all over the place here. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be warm. Uh, <laughs> this is true. Yes. Pat, uh, uh, before we wrap this up, and I cut yeah. you off six times, because now I'm trying to make up for my lack of minutes uh, in the actual interview, because you know I never explain education through sports analogies, but I went back and I, I checked my minutes on the field, uh, my playing time during that episode, and it was a small, small percentage. And so I feel like I got more to give to the game now. Okay. I wasn't stopping you. You didn't have to give me that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> but I was desperate because I hadn't given a sports analogy. <laughs> yes. Pav, why don't we say uh, a little hint on what we're up to. Mm -hmm. And by what we're up to, I really just mean what you're up to. <laughs> um, oh, you want me to do that? I thought you were going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's your conference. <laughs> it's not my conference, no. Uh, but I will be presenting at the ETFO ICT Women's Conference on November 14th and 15th. So if you are going to be attending, I am looking forward to see uh, to seeing you there. Uh, this is going to be a phenomenal event and I will be presenting on the collective work of Che and myself on reframing Remembrance Day digital photography uh, through um, photog sorry, digital storytelling through photography and photo editing. So I'm very excited to bring that work to two two-hour workshops, not just one workshop, but um, it'll be a full-day event, and I'm very excited about that. You are going to crush that. And if you're still looking for more ChainPav action, of course, you can look at ChainPav.com, and we can help you, your school, your district, with all their podcasting needs, the software, the hardware, and maybe even the story, the magnificent microphone to amplify and ignite your podcast journey thank you so much and thank you to everyone who is listening right now um, we are so happy that you joined us for episode 130 labor and love with salima kassam and you've been listening to the che and pav show <laughs>